Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the human papillomavirus entry mechanism. Okay, so in this next video we're going to discuss macropinocytosis, which is the final of the three endocytosis processes that I want to discuss in this video, and another endocytosis process by which we believe HPV variants may gain access to the endocytic pathway of the basal cells. Now, uh, of the three processes that we've been through, macropinocytosis is the least well understood of the three. Clathrin mediated endocytosis was the best understood of the three. Caviolin mediated endocytosis came in second place. And macropinocytosis, I'm afraid, comes in last place as far as how much we know about it is concerned. It also has a number of differences compared to clathrin-mediated endocytosis and caviolin-mediated endocytosis, as you'll see when we now describe it. So let's begin the description of what happens in macropinocytosis. So let's start by drawing a piece of cell membrane here, and let's say that we have some receptor here in the cell membrane, in red here, that has some cargo that we want to endocytose bound to it, and that this receptor cargo complex is going to be endocytosed by the macropinocytosis process. So you could imagine that this is the secondary receptor with the virus particle bound to it that is now going to stimulate the macropinocytosis process. So the first big difference between macropinocytosis and the other two is that macropinocytosis comes to the receptor cargo complex, whereas the other two, remember, they occurred at specific portions of membrane and the receptor cargo complex complex had to go to them for the endocytosis process. It had to localise itself to those places, whereas not so for macropinocytosis. Macropinocytosis comes to the receptor um, cargo complex. And the other big difference now is that these other two processes, they both involved the membrane invaginating inwards. That was the way that you formed the intracellular membrane-bound compartment, by the membrane invaginating inwards and budding off. In macropinocytosis, we are not going to see any invagination. Instead, we are going to see evagination occurring, so very, very different. So let me now draw what's going to happen. So... When the receptor binds its cargo, it's going to activate intracellular signaling pathways that are not well understood, that are then going to lead to evagination of the membrane surrounding this receptor cargo complex. So let me draw this here. So you're going to get the membrane evaginating outwards um, by this receptor cargo complex, like so and it will have evaginated on the other side as well, like this. So the receptor cargo complex will now be still in the center here. So there's the receptor, and here is the cargo bound to it there in green. Okay, so you're getting evagination of the membrane on either side of the receptor cargo complex here. And these evaginations have special names. They are known as lamellopodia. And this, that's clearly the plural. The singular is lamellopodium. So the receptor cargo complex stimulates intracellular signaling pathways, which result in the formation of these lamellopodia. What are these lamellopodia? How do they form? Well, as I say, the signaling pathways aren't well understood, but let's think a little bit more about what these things actually are. Remember, a point that I have hammered home a lot in this video, the membrane is just gloop. It does not determine the shape of the cell. What determines the shape of the cell is the cytoskeleton. So if you have these lamellopodia forming, there must be something in this column here, in the cytoplasm here, that is causing the membrane to evaginate like that, i.e. the cytoskeleton has changed shape in order to produce these lamellopodia. It's not the membrane that is causing this, it's the cytoskeleton changing shape, and the membrane's just being forced to follow the cytoskeleton. So let's just draw in some cytoskeleton then. So in mint green here, these are representing cytoskeletal fibres inside the lamellopodia. So that is what is happening. The receptor cargo complex stimulates an intracellular signaling pathway that results 
in this assembly of the cytoskeleton in this way to form these lamella podia. Now, next question, what form of cytoskeletal fibre is it that is actually assembling in this way to form the lamella podia? Well, remember, there are three major fibre types of the cytoskeleton. There are the microfilaments, and those are the ones that are going to be important here. They're also called actin microfilaments. That's a more precise name for them, but you can just call them microfilaments. These are the smallest fibres of the cytoskeleton. Then there are the intermediate filaments, of which keratin filaments are an example. And then up from that, there are microtubules, which are the biggest type of fibres in the cytoskeleton. So those are the three major fibres of the cytoskeleton. The microfilaments, which are made of actin, the intermediate filaments, of which there are loads of different types, but keratin is a good example to remember. And then the macrofilaments, if you like, which are the microtubules made out of tubulin proteins. So, actin microfilaments then, let's just talk a little bit about the structure of an actin microfilament. So these are long, long fibres that are constructed out of the protein actin. Now, actin is a small globular protein, so this circle can represent an actin protein. What happens is, to create an actin microfilament, loads of the actin monomers assemble together to form a great big long chain like so, and then two of these great big long polymers of actin monomers intertwine with each other to create an actin microfilament. So just drawing this picture, if I now represent the actin um, polymer here in red like so, and I'll get a thicker pen for this. So if this red line is now going to represent a polymer of actin monomers. What you have to create an actin microfilament is two actin polymers intertwined like so with one another, and that is what an actin microfilament is. Two polymers of actin monomers, which are globular proteins, intertwined with one another. So that's what actin microfilaments are. You are assembling them in this way to create these lamina podia. Now, remember that this picture that I've drawn you here is a two-dimensional picture. Let's just draw a brief picture of what this would look like if we were to see it from above, a more sensible angle. Okay, so, well, not a more sensible angle, but another angle. So looking at it from another angle, here is one lamella podium coming up, here's the other lamella podium coming up, and then we'll have the receptor in the centre, and... Uh, the cargo bounds to it here. Okay, so what needs to happen is these lamella podia need to continue on growing, grow right over the top here, and start to fuse together. And that, I hope you will agree, if it occurs all the way around here, so you need to grow on the sides as well, if, you, if that occurs, you're going to be able to create an intracellular membrane compartment. So drawing it again in the two-dimensional way here, what you'll end up with is something like this. Okay, and then you will have this compartment inside now, inside the cell, which will have your receptor bound to its cargo here in green. So I hope you understand what's happened. These have grown further and then they fuse together at the top here and that has created an intracellular membrane compartment provided of course that it goes in three-dimensional space. So this has to grow around like this and it has to fuse along an entire arch effectively along there to create the intracellular membrane compartment. And this is now an intracellular membrane compartment that can then go into the endocytic pathway. It's just like an endocytic vesicle. It will go uh, to the early endosome and then it will have delivered the receptor cargo complex into the endocytic pathway. So that is the process of macropinocytosis. And now I'm just going to summarize it and then we will continue on with the story of um, the human papillomavirus entry mechanism. So, macropinocytosis, very different from the other two. You get a receptor cargo complex forming in the cell membrane here, 
and unlike the other two where you get invagination, you now get evagination, and the process comes to the receptor cargo complex. So you get evagination of the membrane on either side, producing these lamella podia, and it's the actin microfilament component of the cytoskeleton that is assembling to form these lamella podia, and they get so large that they can then fuse together at the sensor, and you've then got a complete coating over the receptor cargo complex, and now the receptor cargo complex is going to be in an intracellular compartment here that can now uh, function as an endocytic vesicle, effectively. It can go to fuse with the early endosome, and it's delivered its receptor cargo complex into the early endosome. So, it's quite easy to understand, then, how uh, this can apply for the HPV virion if this is the pathway that indeed HPV virions can use, then the HPV virus particle will bind to the secondary receptor, that will trigger conformational changes on the intracellular aspect of the secondary receptor, activating these signaling pathways that lead to the macropinocytosis process, and then you'll get the receptor virus complex uh, ending up in this intracellular vesicle here, and then going off to uh, the early endosome. So overall, what we've got to at this point is this bit here, number seven. The human papillomavirus is in the early endosome, and we now want to see what's going to happen after that. Uh, so let's come over here and draw what we've got to at this stage. So I'm going to effectively draw this picture, but larger now. So here is our early endosome drawn larger, so here's one of those tubules that can give off vesicles going to the plasma membrane or to the recycling endosome. Okay, so this is our endosome, and I won't necessarily call it an early endosome, it's an endosome somewhere along the maturation process. So what's going to happen now is that our vesicle with the secondary receptor and the human papillomavirus particle bound to it in it, however it's been endocytosed through whichever pathway that we've now discussed in detail, it's going to fuse with the early endosome and put its contents into the early endosome. So here is the secondary receptor, once again in vivid purple here, and then here is the virus particle in scary red. And again, I'll draw now the virus particle properly. So there's the capsid, and here is the viral genome inside, represented by that circle. So, what happens next? Well, it's hijacked the endocytosis machinery to get into an early endosome. What normally happens in early endosomes? The cargo usually splits off from the receptor, and that's exactly what's going to happen now. Why does it usually split? Because of the pH going down. So as the endosome matures, the pH in the endosome is going to go down, and we think the endosome has to get quite far along its maturation before the pH gets low enough, acidic enough, that the virus particle will cleave away from the secondary receptor. But that is overall going to happen, so let's draw this here. So next what's going to happen is the virus particle is going to cleave away from the receptor, like so. And um, where's the colour for the genome? Uh, not that colour, this colour. So here's the genome. So it's going to cleave away from the receptor. In addition, what's going to happen is the capsid is now going to break down in the endosome as the pH goes down. So not only will it cleave away from the receptor when the pH goes down, but also you will start to get the capsid breaking down. The L1 particles will start to break apart from one another. The capsomeres will break apart. The L1 and the L2 proteins will break apart from one another. So the whole capsid is going to start to break down. And this is going to be facilitated by an enzyme that is present in the endosomes. And this enzyme we've already met, it's this cyclophilin B enzyme, which I will remind you is our peptidyl prolyl isomerase enzyme that can cause changes in conformation of, um, of protein molecules. So, you have cyclophilin B enzymes within the lumen of endosomes. So, I'll just put this here. So, here is our cyclophilin B enzyme there in um, yellow. 
and that's the abbreviation, remember, for cyclophilin B. So what's going to happen is due to the low pH and due to the cyclophilin B, the capsid is going to break down. Uh, so the viral genome is going to be released. Now here's something that I need to tell you that I didn't tell you when we were going over the structure of the virus particle, but which I meant to tell you, which is that both of the capsid proteins, both L1 and L2, have the ability to bind to the viral genome. And this makes utter sense. Remember, when these things are produced, how do you actually get a viral genome inside a capsid? Well, the way that it happens is that the capsid proteins have to be able to bind to the viral genome. They have to be able to bind to the DNA so that they can then actually assemble with the viral genome inside. If they didn't, if they weren't capable of binding to the DNA, you can imagine that it would be a real struggle to get this capsid to assemble correctly without the viral genome at some point, you know, straying off and then ending up with a capsid with no genome inside. So capsid proteins do have to be able to bind to the viral genome. And indeed, both the L1 and the L2 proteins can bind to the viral genome. So if I just draw another picture of the um, virus particle, a big good picture of the virus particle. So here is the capsid. And remember, this is going to consist of loads of capsomeres. So here's an example of a capsomere. Here's another example of a capsomere here. And we'll have one more example of a capsomere here. And uh, then, of course, uh, I'll draw the L2 proteins in the middle of the capsomere protein. Of the, well, of the L1 pentamers. So here's one L2 protein, here's another L2 protein, and here's another L2 protein. So both the L1 proteins in the capsomere pentamers and the L2 proteins are capable of binding to the viral genome, which I'll put in like so. Now, of course, not all the L1 and L2 proteins of the capsid will be able to bind to the genome, but a lot of them will be bound to the genome. Now, why am I bringing this up at this point? Well, what's now going to happen is when this capsid breaks apart, so when all the L1s start to break apart from the L2s and the other L1s, the whole thing starts to fall apart. What's going to happen is some of the L2 proteins are going to remain bound to the viral genome. So overall, what the consequence of this is, and I'm going to move to a different picture now, is that inside the early endosome, you are going to end up with your viral genome, which I'm drawing simply as a ring. Remember, it will have histones as well, but we'll draw it simply as a ring like so. Will now be bound just to L2 proteins. So here's an L2 protein, here's another L2 protein, another L2 protein, etc. You get the idea. So what actually happens is when the virus capsid breaks down in the endosomes, you get what we call an L2 vDNA complex or viral genome complex formed. So this is what the overall result of arriving in an endosome is going to be. Now, let's just use a little bit of intuition here. Let's have a think. If this thing, this L2 vDNA complex, remains in the lumen of the endosome, then the endosome is just going to mature and fuse with lysosomes, and in the lysosomes are loads of enzymes that can break down genomes. So the whole thing will be destroyed if it stays in the endosome. It therefore is not going to stay in the endosome. All the L1 proteins and the L2 proteins that aren't bound to the genome, they will remain in the endosome and they'll be destroyed uh, when the endosome matures completely and fuses with lysosomes. But the L2 vDNA complex is now going to leave the major endocytic pathway. It's going to leave these endosomes. Now, it's not well understood how it does this, but what we absolutely do know is that this mechanism by which it leaves the endosomes is absolutely dependent on L2. This is where L2 becomes important. I said to you right at the start, L2 is not important until right at the end. L1 is really important. If you just have L1 and you don't have L2 in your capsid, you get all the way along this pathway. You get here, uh, you get into the early endosome, everything works perfectly. 
And the capsid then breaks down and the viral genome is on its own with no L2. And without the L2, it does not leave the endosome. It stays in the endosome and is destroyed by the lysosomes, which is useless for the virus. L2 now becomes important. L2 stays bound to the viral DNA and it is going to help the viral DNA get out of the endosome where it faces certain doom if it stays. Okay, so this is where L2 is important. And another thing to add in, you remember me telling you long, long ago, and I'll try and find that long, long ago um, here. Or is it here? Yes, here. You remember me telling you long, long ago that when the virus initially bound to the heparin sulfate proteoglycans and cyclophilin B caused conformational changes in both L1 and L2, the L1 conformational change was important for you being able to transfer onto the secondary receptor, which L1 binds to. The L2 conformational change allowed the amino terminus to become visible on the surface of the virus particle, and then it was chopped off by furin or proprotein convertase 5-6, which are both endoproteases. That cleavage is essential for L2 to function at the end here. If that cleavage has not occurred, if you inhibit furin or proprotein convertase 5-6 and that doesn't occur, then these L2 proteins, even if they are present, then they cannot escape the endosome with the viral DNA. So for the L2 protein to function, it had to be cleaved by furin when the virus particle was still on the surface of the cell. So this is a quite complicated story. So L2 is absolutely essential for now the viral DNA to escape from the endosomes and stop it being doomed to uh, be broken down by the enzymes from the lysosome when they fuse with the late endosome. And the L2 protein is only going to function if it was cleaved by uh, furin or proprotein converters 5-6 on the surface of the basal cell. So this is where the story doesn't get very detailed at all, I'm afraid. Somehow, mechanism we don't understand because it's only become apparent that this is what happens very recently. Mechanism we don't understand. When the L2 has been cleaved by furin or proprotein converters and it is bound to vDNA, so let's say all of these L2s here that I am colouring in in vivid red, let's say they've all had the cleavage occur, they are bound to the viral DNA. When you have this complex, this complex is capable of escaping the endosome. And where does it go? We think it goes to the trans-Golgi network. So most likely, it is capable of getting itself out of the early endosome. It's capable of coming off in a vesicle that then goes to the trans-Golgi network. But we don't understand how it achieves that at all at the moment. What we do um, think happens, and this is only recently that we've come up with this theory that this is what happens. We think it goes to the trans-Golgi network and then it seems to go retrogradely through the secretory pathway. It goes to the cis-Golgi network, so it makes its way back through the Golgi. Then it goes from the cis-Golgi network to the endoplasmic reticulum here. And then it starts to accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum. So overall, the HPV um, viral genome with the L2 complexes is going to end up in the endoplasmic reticulum, and also in the Golgi apparatus. Now, what you have to remember is that when you've been exposed to human papillomaviruses, you're unlikely to have just been exposed to one human papillomavirus. So that's why I say that the L2 viral genome complexes will accumulate in the endoplasmic reticulum, because you've probably got loads of these uh, human papillomaviruses coming into the single basal cell, and therefore loads of L2 viral genome complexes coming into this secretory pathway compartments. Okay, what colour did I colour in the um, L2? So we'll have them, I'll just put them in vivid red here because they're the bad guys now. They are the things that result in the viral genome not being destroyed. So here is our L2 vDNA complex. So some of them will accumulate in the trans-Golgi network, some will be in the cis-Golgi network, but their, origin, their eventual target is the endoplasmic reticulum here. Now, how then are they going to get into the nucleus? Well, you might think, okay, they'll go through here and then they'll somehow just have to get through the inner membrane, but it's more complicated than that. They actually have to wait for the basal cell to divide. When the basal cell goes through 
division, the cell cycle, it has to go through the process of mitosis, which is the name for nuclear division. So I'll just write that down. People often get confused about mitosis. People think mitosis is the name for cell division. No, mitosis is strictly speaking the name for nuclear division. It's when you have a cell, let's say here we have our basal cell, and it goes from having one nucleus to having two nuclei that are identical to one another, like so. Uh, that is the process of mitosis. One nucleus to two nuclei that are identical to one another. It means the nuclear division rather than the cell division. Now, of course, nuclear division has to precede cell division. What will now happen is this cell with two identical nuclei will split into two cells that both have identical nuclei, like so. That's the cell division process. Now, when basal cells divide, as indeed we know they do, they are stem cells, they have to therefore copy the nucleus. They have to go through mitosis. And when mitosis occurs, the nuclear envelope breaks down uh, so that you can uh, split the copied chromosomes apart um, and then put the, uh, move them apart in the cell and then reform nuclear envelopes around both of them. And also, that means that the endoplasmic reticulum is going to break down, and even the Golgi apparatus breaks down as well. And what do I mean when I say breaks down? I mean that it dissipates into loads of little pieces. So just to draw a little bit of the nuclear envelope. So let's just draw the nuclear envelope here with an endoplasmic reticulum. So this is just supposed to represent the same thing that we've got here. This is the nu inside of the nucleus. This is the nuclear envelope, the two membranes of the nuclear envelope, and this is a piece of endoplasmic reticulum. In mitosis, where we are going from having one nucleus to having two nuclei, um, of course, you will already have copied the DNA. So this nucleus will have double the amount of DNA. Every single chromosome will be copied. And now, in the actual process of mitosis, which is where you're going to split the chromosomes apart and create two separate nuclei that are identical to one another, you have to firstly break down the nuclear envelope. And the way you do this is by splitting it into loads of little membrane-bound compartments. So this is what's going to happen. The nuclear envelope splits into all these little membrane-bound compartments like so. It disperses, I think, is the piece of terminology people like to use. And the endoplasmic reticulum disperses as well. So it splits up into loads of little pieces. And these can all fuse back together when we want to reassemble nuclear envelopes and endoplasmic reticulums. And the same thing actually happens to the Golgi apparatus. It disperses into lots of little membrane-bound compartments. And the idea then is that when this mitosis occurs and the nuclear envelope and the endoplasmic reticulum disperses like this, some of the virus particles can escape from the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and of course, sorry, they're not virus particles anymore. Some of these L2 uh, viral genome complexes can escape from the endoplasmic reticulum, end up in the cytoplasm in the dispersing process. So here is the L2 viral genome complex, and then they can end up going inside where the nucleus will be when it reforms. And I apologise if you can hear that racket that's going on outside. It doesn't last for long. It's an ice cream lolly lo lo um, van or something. Okay, um, so, ah, it's gone. Uh, so, where was I? So, um, we were discussing the final bits in the HBV entry mechanism then. So, we have got the L2 viral genome complex. It has gone through this process where it's gone back to the trans-Golgi network and then it's made its way through the trans-Golgi network to the cis-Golgi network. And then it's come through into the endoplasmic reticulum and... During the mitosis process, what can then happen when the um, endoplasmic reticulum disperses into loads of little membrane-bound compartments is that some L2 viral genome complexes can escape into the cytoplasm and then they can go into the portion of cytoplasm where a nucleus will reform. And of course, two nuclei are going to reform. So it can go into the area of cytoplasm where one of the nucleuses is going to reform and then it will be in the nucleus when that nucleus does reform. So if I now draw one of the nuclei reforming, and I'll go back to having the fin pen, uh, so 
will then end up with one of the nuclei reforming like so. And of course you'll have two nuclei in the cell because nuclear division has occurred, so I'll draw another one here. But let's say the L2 viral genome complex was able to get to the position where one of the nuclei will reform, then it will be in the nucleus at the end. So just to complete this up, here are the L2 proteins there. Okay, and that is how it gets into the nucleus of one of the basal cells. So I'm now going to summarise the entire entry mechanism by which the human papillomaviruses get into the basal cells of the squamous stratified epithelium. So from the beginning, remember the whole process begins with a microabrasion. Then what happens is the human papillomaviruses come in and initially they're going to bind to the basement membrane. The L1 proteins bind to heparin sulfate proteoglycans in the basement membrane, specifically the perlecan uh, heparin sulfate proteoglycans are an example of a heparin sulfate proteoglycan in the basement membrane. Then what's going to happen is they're going to transfer to cell surface heparin sulfate proteoglycans and this is going to occur because of the healing process. So when we heal this area that has had the microabrasion, basal cells will divide to give two basal cells and you'll repopulate the basal cell there. So that means basal cells are going to be moving over this area where the HPV virus is bound to the basement membrane. Now they have cell surface uh, prote heparin sulfate proteoglycans, an example being syndicum 1 on heparin sulfate proteoglycans and then the virus particle can move from being bound to the ones in the basement membrane to being bound on the ones on the cell membrane on the basal size side of the basal cell. Right, so we've now got the virus particle bound to the surface of our basal cell. Next, what is going to follow is a conformational change that is catalyzed by cyclophilin B. So cyclophilin B is an enzyme that is also bound to heparin sulfate proteoglycans on the cell surface, and it's a peptidyl prolyl isomerase enzyme, and it can catalyze changes in conformation in both L1 and L2. So you get conformational changes in L1 proteins of the viral capsid and L2 proteins of the viral capsid. L1's conformational change then allows the virus to move from being bound to the cell surface heparin sulfate proteoglycans to being bound to the secondary receptor. L2's conformational change exposes its amino terminus on the outer side of the virus particle and it can then be cleaved by extracellular matrix furin and proprotein convertase 5 slash 6 enzymes uh, which cut off the first 12 amino acids and that cleavage is essential for L2 later on performing its function in helping the viral genome escape from the endosome. Okay, uh, so continuing the process on, because of the conformational change in L1 proteins, once you've got enough L1 proteins that have undergone this conformational change, you will move from being bound to heparin sulfate proteoglycans on the cell surface to being bound to the secondary receptor. The secondary receptor's identity is not known. It may be the case that different types of human papillomaviruses have different secondary receptors, but it is the L1 proteins that bind to the secondary receptors, not the L2 proteins. The evidence for that is that if you take L2 proteins completely out of the capsid, the virus particle can still bind to the secondary receptor and still enter the cell. So the secondary receptor is going to be the entry receptor, the primary receptor is merely an attachment receptor. So entry receptor then, the secondary receptor is an entry receptor I said, that means that it's going to be the one that mediates the endocytosis of the human papillomavirus particle and it's controversial what the mechanism of endocytosis that the secondary receptor with the HPV virus particle bound to it is actually going to use. These three are the major three that are being considered as mechanisms. Clathrin mediated endocytosis, um, which as we've discussed uh, involves the membrane invaginating inwards. So let's just remind ourselves of this process. So uh, it happens at regions of membrane where there are lots of PI45P2 molecules. Adapter proteins can bind to those PI45P2 molecules, causing the membrane to bend. They recruit clathrin trischelia, which begin to assemble the clathrin uh, spherical um, casing and they continue to cause the membrane to bend and invaginate inwards. The adapter proteins also recruit cargo 
bound, receptors with cargo bound to them into this region where the endocytosis is going to occur. So uh, if the virus's entry mechanism is through graphene-mediated endocytosis, then it will bind to the secondary receptor, and either the secondary receptor will already have a internalization motif visible on its internal aspect, in which case it will go into this portion of the membrane just by diffusion, and then will get stuck there because the internalization motif will bind to adapter proteins, or it will be the case that when the virus bound, it causes a conformational change that exposes the internalization motif, and that will again lead to the um, bind virus secondary receptor complex accumulating or localizing in the clathrin coated pit. Dynamin is responsible for the clathrin coated pit um, being uh, cut away from the plasma membrane. You end up with a clathrin coated uh, vesicle, uncoating follows and you then have an endocytic vesicle that can begin its journey through the endocytic pathway. The other option is caviolin-mediated endocytosis. Uh, this involves endocytosis of cavioli, these little caves in the cell membrane. Uh, and again, it's mediated by dynamin, which just cuts the cavioli off from uh, the plasma membrane. Now, um, we don't fully understand if this is the case that the human papillomaviruses use caviolin-mediated endocytosis, quite how uh, caviolin-mediated endocytosis is activated. And that's because we don't understand full stop how it's activated. Uh, so all we can say in that, uh, with regards to that mechanism, is that the human papillomavirus secondary receptor complex must localize in cavioli uh, that are undergoing caviolin-mediated endocytosis. Whether they are the things that actually trigger the caviolin, uh, the caviolin mediated endocytosis in a caviola. Uh, we can't currently say, but that's another mechanism by which it can get into uh, endocytic vesicles that can then begin their journey through the endocytic pathway. Macropinocytosis is the final pathway. This involves evagination of the membrane around the receptor virus um, complex uh, to form these lamellar podia which then uh, fuse together to make an intracellular compartment with the uh, virus cargo complex inside, sorry, the virus receptor complex inside. Uh, that's a, another option for how uh, the virus bound to the secondary receptor can end up in an endocytic vesicle. So those are the three endocytosis pathways that we've discussed. Overall, all of them whichever one the virus is using, and it may be the case that the secondary receptor with the virus bound to it can use multiple of those different pathways, they overall end up with the virus particle bound to the secondary receptor inside a vesicle that is then going to fuse with the early endosome. So overall, the secondary receptor with the virus bound to it ends up in this early endosome. The pH goes down gradually as the endosome matures. That will cause the virus to cleave away from the secondary receptor. The lower pH, the acidic pH, also causes the capsid to start breaking down. The L1 proteins stop binding to one another. Capsomeres stop binding to each other. The capsomeres themselves start falling apart. And this is all facilitated by the cyclophilin B enzyme, which aids in the conformational change. Um, finally, what you end up with in the endosomes is the viral genome released, but it's still bound to some of these L2 proteins, and these are the saviors of the genome. These are going to get the genome out of the endosome. Now, in order for them to perform this function, they must have been cleaved by furin or proprotein convertase 5 slash 6 long, long ago uh, when the virus was on the surface of the cell. Now, how do they get them out of the endosomes? We don't know, uh, but what we do know is that overall the L2 viral genome complexes end up in the trans-Golgi network, and from there they move through the Golgi retrogradely back to the cis-Golgi network and even back to the endoplasmic reticulum. So it's likely that they leave the early endosome by a vesicle, but how they trigger that uh, budding off from the endosome we don't currently know. Overall, the viral genome complex ends up in the endoplasmic reticulum here, and then how does it end up in the nucleus? It relies on the uh, cell dividing, the basal cell dividing, and remember we're in the healing process, so it's likely that when the basal cell divides, it's going to be making two separate basal cells um, because of the microabrasion that has occurred. 
So uh, what happens when the cell divides? The nucleus has to divide. So firstly, of course, the genome will be copied inside the nucleus, and then nuclear division occurs, which is the process of mitosis. Now, in mitosis, of course, you have to split apart the identical chromosomes, and you have to split the nucleus. And for this, the nuclear envelope completely breaks down, and the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus also break down with it. They disperse into these little uh, membrane-bound compartments, which can then refuse together to recreate nuclear envelopes afterwards. So it's not impossible to appreciate that in this process you could end up with some uh, viral uh, genome L2 complexes escaping from the endoplasmic reticulum um, lumen and ending up in the cytoplasm. So when the dispersal occurs it appears that the L2 viral genome complex can then escape from the endoplasmic reticulum and then it will make its way to part of the cytoplasm where a nucleus is going to reform and then it will end up inside the nucleus and now the viral genome L2 complex is inside the nucleus of a basal cell and it can begin uh, its the rest of its life cycle. It has infected the cell. It will now start to use host, host cell machinery to firstly make proteins and then to copy its DNA. If you want to know more about the rest of the life cycle of the human papillomavirus, I refer you to one of the videos that I've made entitled HPVs and Cervical Cancer, in which we discuss uh, the life cycle uh, after this point. So I'm going to end this video now. Thank you for watching.